Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on recent developments in managed care. I'm Katie Campbell, an associate here at McGuire Woods, and I'll be one of your presenters. Um, I'll have our other two presenters introduce themselves. Um, sure. Uh, Ed Brooks, I'm a partner at McGuire Woods, and I focus on um, healthcare litigation. And this is Steve Hamilton. I'm also a partner here in the Chicago office of McGuire Woods and focus my practice on uh, healthcare litigation, primarily representing managed care organizations. So today we will be discussing um, a number of topics related to um, recent developments in managed care, including the effects of COVID on litigation, balanced billing laws and out-of-network disputes, uh, Medicare Advantage and Medicaid MCO issues, as well as issues involving ADR. We'll have Steve Hamilton kick us off with the effects of COVID on litigation. Thanks, Katie. So I want to start out by talking about what's on everyone's mind at all times, I'm sure, um, particularly as we hopefully see a vaccine rolling out uh, and distributed soon. Um, but anyway, the, you know, COVID, like, Everything else in the world has affected litigation, and it's affected both managed care litigation, healthcare litigation. Um, one particular thing is we don't know what the total fallout will be from a litigation and healthcare perspective from COVID, but what we do believe is that it'll create new litigation issues for years to come, and it's also not going to be limited to managed care. I'll give you a good example. Back in August. Um, one of the unions filed suit against HCA in Florida, uh, or I'm sorry, in California State Court, alleging that the um, that HCA and the hospital and that Riverside community uh, there basically failed to take reasonable measures to protect its workers from the uh, effects of COVID. Um, and it's interesting because the plaintiffs are essentially people that are outside of the HCA. Um, uh, patient stream, their their workers, their union members, and they're alleging that HCA, for instance, required them to work without appropriate protective equipment, um, and basically having to reuse equipment that's supposed to be single use, and just generally not having the appropriate precautions in place. So we do know that um, you know COVID is going to be far-reaching in terms of litigation. Um, one of the main things that hit us right away was the procedural changes that we saw, um, particularly in courts. So, for instance, uh, trials have been delayed, and we'll talk about that in a second, but uh, substantial delays in jury trials. And like everything else, actual day-to-day -day court proceedings, whether it's motions or otherwise, have shifted to the uh, uh, virtual realm, uh, which Ed and Katie can weigh in, but I kind of like it because you get to um, – deal with the issues um, pretty quickly. and You don't have to spend three or four hours marching down to the courtroom. Um, we've seen appellate courts and other courts uh, live stream their, their hearings now. For instance, we had a Second Circuit appeal that we got to watch on YouTube because uh, one of the co-defendants was arguing it. So uh, fundamentally changed. Um, in terms of the specifics in discovery, um, and I'd love to get Ed and Katie to weigh in too on this, Written discovery hasn't really been impacted, but uh, depositions have gone almost entirely virtual. Um, I don't. I think at the beginning there was some pushback by the parties to say, well, we want to hold off and do key witnesses in person. But as COVID dragged on, you know, reality took over and ended up most depositions being done virtually. And there's different platforms with different uh, technical issues and different ways to handle the logistics like exhibits and whatnot. And, and quite frankly, nothing's perfect, but it's also, um, to a certain degree, you know, 90% perfect. So uh, I think one takeaway from COVID may be that depositions continue to be virtual for a period of time, if not for a long time, because of the uh, continuing ease at which you can do these depositions and also the cost savings. We don't have to travel to other states or, or otherwise to take a deposition. Um, so Steve, bottom line, Steve, yeah, go ahead, Ed. I'm sorry, you, you kind of said maybe we had some thoughts on this, and I, I definitely wanted to comment on the depositions. You know, Katie and I have done a ton of depositions virtually. Um, 
and a couple of things that come to mind that are worth mentioning, and, and I presume folks on the call have done depositions too, so I'm not assuming I'm talking to people that haven't, but having done so many, I will tell you uh, there's a couple of things to think about. One is um, don't accept for face value that the platform that um, the court reporter tells you that you're going to use is, is okay. In other words, really kind of look into it because we, we were faced in one of the cases we had where we were doing tons of depositions with two, two different platforms, the one we chose and then the one the other side chose with their court report, and one was clearly better than the other. Uh, and better in a way, I'll just tell you real quick, which was, you know, both could show documents while you're doing the dep, but one had a better feature such that the witness could actually look at the document um, much like they would if they were in live person, kind of flip through it uh, without the other side seeing what they're looking at and, and knowing what they're doing, whereas the other platform was more clunky. It just allowed the, the questioner to just put the document up on the screen so everybody could see it, and then the witness had to tell the questioner where to go so the witness could look at it. I mean, you can imagine with a case like we had in particular, which was a lot of documents, how clunky and long, uh, how hard it is to work with that, and, and it really made a difference. So I, I guess I would just caution folks who haven't really dug into this yet, you know, really look at that that platform. Um, I echo Steve's thoughts, though, that overall um, this is going to be a, a lasting change, I believe, um, maybe except for, you know, significant parties or experts, but we took all our debts, you know, in a couple of cases, and, and it actually worked fairly well. Um, so I'm um, much a, an adopter of that technology. Right, and one of the other things that um, you run into, uh, and I ran into this in a case recently where the parties stipulated that, you know, no one could be in the room with witnesses. And we, in one of our cases where we were a third-party witness, our client said, well, we want someone there with this person. He's a C-suite level person, and we want someone there to be able to uh, be in the room with them. And, you know, we had to go around the stipulation and work with the parties, and that just, it ultimately worked out, but it became, you know, just yet another logistical hurdle due to this virtual deposition. Um, so depositions are changing. The motion practice realm is changing. Um, you know, largely perhaps for the better, but with, without, not without its hurdles. The big issue here are the trials and the jury trials particularly. So um, as I mentioned, most jury trials are being delayed indefinitely or having dates set just aspirationally. And we've had very few across the nation jury trials commence. That being said, there are some jury trials happening, um, and albeit in limited fashion, uh, courts are starting to step out and try to uh, accomplish these jury trials. But at the same time, you'll see, even if you just read anything about this, that the plaintiff's bar and, and prominent plaintiff's firms are encouraging their clients not to proceed with jury trials that are virtual uh, unless they agree to them because of the constitutional issues that arise as a result of these. So if you have jury trials, you know, you're going to be faced with a position of either agreeing to a virtual setting or potentially being uh, forced into that, which immediately raises an appellate issue. Uh, but for instance, there have been some trials that have occurred uh, in Jacksonville, Florida in August, uh, what people believe was maybe the first binding jury trial by agreement was a personal injury case where the plaintiff uh, won. It was a couple day jury trial. In Seattle, Washington this past October, so about a month and a half ago, there was another personal injury case um, that went to trial by agreement. But the downfalls that I was mentioning, for instance, there was a jury trial in New Jersey in October in a criminal case, and the judge immediately suspended it after the plaint or, I'm sorry, the defense attorney started to raise objections about the virtual jury selection that was put in place raising concerns about the uh, exclusion of elderly and certain minority groups. So you can see how these issues get embedded when you have um, uh, virtual jury trials that aren't actually by agreement. But as we also look forward, we see that courts, you know, state Supreme Courts and otherwise are starting to um, try to prepare for this virtual jury setting. 
and because the reason is, is even with a vaccine, we're going to be in a position of still an extended period of time where, um, you know, not everyone will be vaccinated and it'll be hard to impanel a jury. Um, so, for instance, the Illinois Supreme Court just issued guidelines last month for remote jury selection and what needs to be done to try to select jurors in a remote setting. But interestingly, at least in the Illinois order, um, there's no act, no recommendations about actually conducting a remote jury trial. So you can pick a jury, but they don't tell you how you're going to conduct a remote trial. And it's kind of um, pyrrhic because, for instance, Cook County isn't impaneling juries right now. So it's useless to pick a jury if you're not going to seat a jury. Um, so as we sit here now, jury trials are largely on pause, and they will probably continue to be on pause um, for the near future. Adder, Katie, did you have anything to weigh in on that? No. Great. Well, so switching gears a little bit. So with COVID, we have this, and more applicable to managed care litigation, we have this unique world we're living in, which creates a unique landscape in the managed care business, including you know how managed care organizations and providers are interacting and viewing litigation. We kind of have this perfect storm of factors that are really, um, you know, setting the table for what we think will be future uh, litigation issues and more litigation generally. Uh, for instance, on one side, we have providers that, putting aside some of the uh, federal money that has come in, have otherwise seen a significant cash crunch especially the safety net hospitals. And even with the federal money, we know that safety net hospitals in particular and other providers are really facing um, financial uncertainty. And that stems largely from, you know, the downward trend in non-emergent hospital visits, um, elective services being put on pause in many states for periods of time, and physicians generally not seeing uh, patients for the extended periods of time, uh, particularly when COVID rolled out. So providers are facing this cash crunch. On the flip side, some payers have seen a decrease in claims in the first half of the year and, in, and into the second half of the year, which has, to a certain degree, benefited some payers. But at the same time, these payers are forecasting significant um, both financial uncertainty as to what the future will bring with when that wave of uh, deferred care hits them, but also the effects of COVID and testing, which we'll talk about. So, you know, as we look at the end of this year and into next year, some payers are you know, anticipating significantly increased costs. And we also know on the employer side, um, you know, with the uh, large number of people becoming unemployed, that has impacted payers as well. So we, we do think that there will be uh, an uptick to a significant uptick in payer provider litigation created by this uh, perfect storm. And in, in that context, um, you know, we probably will see these these disputes, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, um, largely shifting into the ADR realm for a while, but, but that's to be determined. Katie, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So what has COVID done in terms of creating any new potential litigation issues for managed care organizations and providers? Um, one of the key areas that we see is potentially litigation relating to testing. So we know generally that testing is going to be covered. We know generally that um, there's going to be a lot of testing. In fact, um, one, I think it was AHIP, yeah, AHIP estimated that antibody testing alone not diagnostic testing, but antibody testing alone will cost payers somewhere around $19 billion. It's a lot of money to just determine if someone previously had COVID. So we know that there's going to be a lot of money in this area, and when there's a lot of money, generally there's a lot of litigation. So this testing that we're talking about, there's two types of testing. One is what we call viral or diagnostic testing, and that's to identify uh, current uh, infection with COVID. The second is called the uh, antibody or serology testing, which identifies a past infection. So why might there be litigation relating to this testing? And, and the answer stems back to the statutory background. So in the Families First Act, back in March of 2020, right when COVID hit, uh, that statute said that 
all public and private insurance needs to provide coverage for FDA-approved COVID-19 tests for in vitro diagnostic testing, which by regulation, pre-existing regulation that the statute just references, means uh, those tests to diagnose conditions. One might think that just means diagnostic testing, um, but subsequent federal guidance has said it means both diagnostic and uh, antibody testing. In any event, the uh, Families First Act requires all testing that's deemed medically appropriate by the attending health care provider to be paid, and it doesn't limit the number of tests. Uh, for all you employers out there, um, note that the federal statutes and guidance does not require coverage of tests uh, for employers who are implementing any testing for purposes of screening. So it's, this is a medical test that's required, not a pro, uh, prophylactic test for purposes of uh, employment or otherwise. And then uh, the second statutory component is the CARES Act, which came out you know, r right after the Family First Act. And what that also did is expanded the coverage of testing to require po private plans to cover out-of-network tests. And this is where the kind of the litigation rubber hits the road. Um, for the out-of-network testing, the statute requires uh, payment at a negotiated rate or, if none, the rate that the, the cash price that the provider posts on its public website. So it's interesting that if you're out of network in a lab, which there's going to be a lot of them, because if you go to the FDA's website, it lists all the labs that are providing uh, approved COVID-19 tests, and there's scores of them, lots of them. Um, you're going to have plans in the position of having to pay cash prices that are posted on websites. And it that that in and of itself, I think, will be an area for potential litigation. Um, one of the other areas, one of the other things that the CARES Act does is requires plans to reimburse items or services necessary to determine or render if a test is appropriate or render the test itself but doesn't set payment rates for that as well. Uh, so you have this statutory background that has really set the stage for testing. And then uh, subsequent federal guidance has come out to really try to uh, clarify what that means. Uh, but at the end of the day, the potential litigation issues relating to um, lab testing and out-of-network lab testing is do the plans and are the providers entitled to these cash rates if there are nuances in those, how they do it. So, for instance, they post the cash rate on a website. Where was it posted? Was it posted after clicking nine times through? Or does it have to be, you know, on the first page, so to speak? Um, what does conspicuously mean? And how do ER hospitals that maybe have um, uh, internal labs in the hospital, how do they post it on their website? Um, another example might be what happens if what I'll say an opportunistic lab, but a, a lab would just say a smart lab, uh, posts a clearly inflated rate on its website. Um, I'm going to give you an example. Um, Kaiser put out kind of some lists of what uh, labs were, were posting on their websites. Medicare pays 100 bucks. This lab posted $229, and right there on its website it says, no payment collected from insured patients. This is our cash price for uninsured. So you have, you know, two and a half times Medicare, um, which may not be egregious, but it's certainly higher than um, $100 that Medicare is determined to be an appropriate reimbursement amount. And then the second main litigation issue I anticipate would be, you know, how do we pay for these other items and services that are required to be provided on an out-of-network basis, but for which there's no um, reimbursement rate set. And usually that will probably boil down to state law or ERISA. Um, the second area, which I'm just really going to quickly talk about, is the value-based care. A lot of the value-based care arrangements that providers and payers have entered into over the past few years have just, you may as well just, uh, toss them out the window because of the effects of COVID. So um, we've seen where uh, these risk-based arrangements, which are based on certain actuarial assumptions on prior spend and anticipated spend, uh, Truly, just those actual assumptions are meaningless these days. So there's potential litigation there as well uh, as it relates to uh, rescission or attempted rescission of those agreements. You, as many of you know, those agreements can be for long term, many years, because they need they need to be for many years at times to uh, average out. 
But when those actuarial assumptions are thrown out the door, how do you handle that? And we may see some actions to try to avoid those contracts for mistake or, or force majeure or other reasons. Uh, the other potential issue is with respect to risk arrangements or just generally our um, payment advances. We know that a lot of plans have uh, given play, payment advances similar to Medicare uh, for its provider for their providers, and we've seen personally uh, and, and dealt with issues when the providers come back and say, "Well, we can't pay this back." So how do we deal with that? And often it's a business resolution, but those can often uh, turn into litigation because there's lots of dollars at stake. And then the final thing, uh, the prior authorization and cost share waivers. So those really are uh, relating back to the Family First Act and CARES Act. They require COVID-19 testing and related items and services to be provided without prior authorization or cost sharing. But where the again, where the litigation rubber hits the road is um, other items or services will need to be paid for, uh, and particularly on an out-of-network basis. But the question becomes, when does that cost sharing waiver and prior authorization waiver begin and end. So for instance, the test itself doesn't need prior authorization. But what happens when the test itself results in an inpatient admission or some other additional services that ostensibly still require prior authorization and the hospital doesn't get the that appropriate prior auth. And as we as most hospitals uh out there know you know, prior authorization can become burdensome. It, it, there's resources that need to be committed. And during COVID, you know, resources are being used elsewhere. So, you know, we have the practical issue of uh, prior authorization not being uh, practically obtainable, but yet still required uh, without the law. So those are some of the main COVID issues we're seeing or anticipate and are seeing now. I mean, with that, I'll let Katie and Ed weigh in. Otherwise, we can move on to the next section. Yeah, I think <clears throat> let's move on. Um, so this is Ed Brooks. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, essentially what we're seeing um, in the litigation we're doing uh, for the most part, just to give you a, an idea of, of, of what we're facing. If we could go to the next slide. So, you know, we're seeing out-of-network disputes with uh, providers. Um, and of course, those who represent providers are, are, are filing those out-of-network out disputes. <laughs> so, uh, just just the different side of the coin. Um, I'm going to talk about what we're seeing in the out-of-network disputes, and I'm going to you know throw in uh, a discussion on balance billing laws. Balance billing laws obviously related to out-of-network because um, they are uh, statutes and regulations issued by states that um, try to. Uh, mollify or reduce the impact uh, of what what's usually called surprise billing um, to, to members. Um, so they're related because they, they, they're passed as it relates to out-of-network providers. So um, we're really seeing, uh, I'm going to just say we're really seeing kind of three kinds of cases. Um, you know, first of all, we're seeing what I'll call the big claim dump cases for out-of-network um, uh, claims and th those are ranging from you know 500 claims to to 5,000 you know or more claims. Um, we're seeing them around the country, but it, there's a seems to be a fair amount of them in Texas, um, and there's some in Illinois. Um, these these claim dump cases can kind of take two uh, two paths. You know, some of them. Um, deal with, uh, let's call it, rate of pay issues predominantly, um, and others have a mixture of rate of pay and let's call it everything else, you know, coding issues, um, you know, prior auth issues, medical necessity issues, uh, member eligible issues, and those kinds of things. These kinds of cases can be uh, you know, fairly daunting and time consuming. And, and, and what I wanted to talk about is not only that, you know, we're seeing a lot of them, but kind of give you some thoughts on what we've done to, to address these kinds of cases. Um, so one thing is, is when you get these out of network cases, particularly the um, uh, ones that have kind of a mixture of, of rate of pay issues, as well as, you know, the, the usual suspects, as I just mentioned, you know, it's really, really important that 
you identify sort of your legal issues and your legal standards your, that, that apply to, let's call it the rate of pay, because the rate of pay issue is really kind of where the, the meat's going to be in most of these cases because they're out of network, right, after all. So the plaintiff is going to argue some sort of, you know, unjust enrichment or, or quantum merit. You know, I provided the service, I should be paid. Um, it's really important in those cases that you – uh, figure out right away what your body of law is applicable to uh, out-of-network claims. And I'll just give you a by-the-way example. Texas has a fairly robust uh, body of law and statutes um, that applies to out-of-network claims, and it depends on the type of policy, whether it's a PPO or an HMO. It depends on whether it's a, uh, you know, a, a plan on the uh, exchange. Uh, it depends on whether it's uh, an employee plan depends on whether it's a federal plan, it depends on a federal employee plan, it depends on whether it's a state local plan. You know, all those w items that I just identified have different laws applied to them. So it's kind of a Rubik's Cube of figuring out, you know, what my law is. And, and the reason you do that, obviously, is you've got to know what your arguments are. But leading to my other point is there's a lot of opportunity for, for what I'll call uh, pre-hearing motions, like summary judgment motions and the like. Um, one of the one of the things that I push real hard uh, in, in cases that we have is we really try to bucket claims, identify them, bucket them, and attack them, you know, in, individually based on a multitude of arguments, whether it be the standard of rate of pay, um, for example, is it uniform customary rate, is it uniform customary charge, is it usual and customary charge. Um, what is your standard rate of pay? And that's different in Texas, depending on whether it's an HMO, PPO, exchange plan, or whatever. Does ERISA preempt uh, these state laws? Largely it does, yes. And so you want to be arguing that. Um, uh, are there prompt pay issues embedded in this? Uh, there wouldn't be prompt pay under Texas if it's an out-of-network. Um, so, you, But you got to know that. Um, there are specific uh, laws and statutes in Texas, uh, you know, the ER payment statutes. A lot of times these are ER-based claims. Um, not surprisingly, because most plans have good networks, people go to their networks largely, but if there's an emergency, they don't, possibly. So that's where they arise. Um, they can get fairly complex, uh, and so it's really important to understand the type of claims and the policies you're dealing with and, and, uh, and to look at the ERISA issues. Uh, as I said, the strategy is to bucket these uh, bucket these claims. Uh, the other thing I'll just add, you might have immunity, sovereign immunity arguments, um, state and local issues, um, uh, 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 members and that sort of thing. So bucket the claims, attack them one by one. We've been successful in cases we've had where we've gotten rulings to reduce the size uh, of these claims uh, by, by summary judgment. I'm finding that more and more arbitrators are very receptive to these types of motions, and particularly in these large claim cases. Um, I'll say the second big important thing is in handling these claim dump cases is to hire a good expert. Um, some, uh, you know, they're, 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 the usual suspects are out there. I'm not going to, you know, promote anyone over another. Um, but I will tell you, you've got to get a, a group of folks that are a able to handle big data. Uh, you know, being able to be um, uh, facile and how they do that, get you stuff back, uh, digest it, um, and secondly, understand healthcare because, as I said, embedded in these legal arguments about the rate of pay are all your ordinary and regular stuff, you know, coding issues, et cetera. Uh, you know, your med is going to, you know, get you in, prior auth is going to get you into, you know, uh, medical issues, which would not be these experts. It would probably be a medical issue, but in, at any rate, um, it's good to. Uh, to have that, but I would I can't stress enough to have a good expert, particularly on the rate of pay issues, because when you get into UCR and UCC, uniform customary rate, uniform customary charge, or usual customary, the, the case law is all over the map on that stuff, and so you really got to get into um, an expert who understands how to to present that data and use what I'll call benchmarks. Um, what we find is there's there's data out there that's for benchmarking on these types of cases. So whether it's Fair Health, which is former Nginx, or whether it's Medicare, uh, you, you've got to use those benchmarks, and it requires some analytics on that. Um, so I can't stress enough, get a good expert. Uh, make sure they've done this many, many times. Not, not, not someone who's smart and understands healthcare, but has never either testified or handled one of these cases. Um, the other area that's important in these big data cases is 
limit discovery. We've been very successful, and usually it works both ways. The provider's typically fairly cooperative on this because uh, you don't want to be, in, 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 you know, you don't want to have just too much to deal with. So we try to limit discovery not only to a sample set, but we always limit it to the claim uh, claim set, the claim data. Now, what I mean by that is not get into emails and and letters and all that stuff between the parties um, because it just it becomes too much. So we, we limit it to the to the claims data, which what I mean by that is the EOBs, the HICPAs, the um, uh, may, maybe there's notes, internal notes, uh, uh, but we really try to limit it. Um, mediation sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. My experience is mostly it doesn't unless it's a limited you know, claim, but usually these big data cases are big claimed up cases are just too big. They're just too big to get your arms around to mediate. You, usually it's just very difficult. Um, the, the other thing to think about when you're handling one of these cases is you got to really think about kind of what your end game is, what you want your hearing to look like, how are you going to present your arguments. So, you know, we've done them where we've had a very uncooperative opposing counsel and it ended up being you know, a very non-streamlined situation where we ended up talking about literally every claim in the sample set. Um, you know, remember uh, what I didn't mention is sampling. I, I definitely am a, a, in favor of sampling. When you have these big claims dump cases, you have to sample. And what I mean by that is you hire an expert that samples. And usually we've been very successful in having both sides agree on the sample set after they've gone through various ways of determining what the sample set should be. Generally what you're doing is you're trying to characterize uh, the, the, the claim set, which is called the population in the world of statistics, and you're trying to characterize it into what, what would generally be like type claims, and that's your, uh, that's your strata in order to get your sample set, and then you pull from your strata to get your sample set. I know that's, uh, you know that's probably very vague and very high level, but that's generally how it's done. But sampling is really important, and what we, what we try to do is have the hearing beyond the sample set, and we actually also um, limit that a little bit, and, and, and when we have our sample sets, let's just say there's um, a 5,000 population claim, your sample set might be somewhere in the range of 1,000 or 1,400 or 1,200. We then break that down into the, your, your various strata, meaning uh, let's call strata being uh, zero pay claims, partial pay claims, um, uh, you know, uh, and then you could come down and, and break it down into, you know, other things like MedNess or, or other kind of like claims. We then would, would have the hearing on uh, some of those, but not all of them. And that's the way we would do it. Um, the other thing we're seeing is, uh, you know, in terms of out of network and maybe not as much as these large claim dumps, but we're seeing for some reason LTAC, uh, long-term care, long-term acute care, uh, claims being brought, um, and, and they tend to be flotsam and jetsam, 8, 10, 20, 30 at, at a time. Um, but I think some of these LTACs tend to be out of network more than others. And so they, we've seen this across the board with various payers. So it's not just one payer, but across the board. And um, those kind of cases can take um, an interesting uh, uh, a curve, and sometimes they're filed in state court um, based on, let's call it common law um, uh, claims like uh, negligent misrepresentation or fraud or breach of oral agreement or promissory estoppel. And what's important there is to look at your underlying claim and determine whether or not ERISA applies. You know, we've been successful in removing, at least so far, some of these claims into federal court um, under ERISA theories because a lot of times there's an ERISA uh, element to them, and many times the, the, the provider is trying to avoid ERISA and, it, and its potential deferential standard and other benefits. So that, that's uh, ERISA, and I should say ERISA is important to look at with your big claim dump cases too, because you, you, you will have an argument potentially to um, avoid the, um, uh, the state law. Uh, on what the standard of rate of pay is and other such things, and you end up with um, the Affordable Care Act, uh, typically the greater rule of three as being the applicable uh, pay rate. Um, so, um, and, and you might also avoid other things like prompt pay arguments and other penalties and, and that sort of thing that you might have in state law. So, um, the, the only other thing I would say is what we're seeing in terms of out-of-network disputes is what I'll call some specialty type 
coverage issues, and in particular, we see a lot of private duty nursing arguments um, and you know coverage on private duty nursing. Um, that's kind of a specialty area. It's probably not worth spending a lot of time on, but but we're seeing that we're, we have a fair number of cases on that. So that that segues me into the next section, um, the balance billing uh, or surprise billing laws update, and I guess we're on that page. So um, you know why is that important? Um, it's important because it, it's something you have to know before you bring the case uh, in terms of like where you bring it. Um, and it's important to know as a defend, you know, as a, if you're defending a case because it might detail um, not only sort of the where it should be brought if it wasn't brought in the right place, but it also might detail um, a method for determining the, the amount of payment, whether it be a mediation or an arbitration. And so you really got to be familiar with that. Um, and um, it does generate a lot of litigation, and I'm going to talk about some of the states here in, in, in a second. Um, the, the balance billing laws, right now, by my count or research, there's 31 states roughly that have enacted what I'll call balance billing laws or surprise prohibitions against surprise billing. And for those of you, I, I assume we've got a sophisticated audience, but what I mean by balance billing or surprise billing is when a, a member goes out of network, either because of an ER visit or they go in network for, for, a, for an in-network um, surgery or something like that, and they happen to see a physician or get a lab that is not in network and therefore they get a balanced surprise bill. They thought they went to network, they thought everything should be, you know, co-pays, et cetera, should be correct, and no, no balanced billing, and they got a balanced bill. So that's what um, balanced billing is, and that's why states have kind of really uh, tackled this issue recently because of what is viewed as the inequities of this. Um, so there's kind of two elements to the balanced billing. You'll see this in the statutes when you look at them. There's the cost-sharing aspect, that is, does the statute address you can't you can't uh, bill beyond the cost sharing in network, or does it address that plus billing, um, you know, for the services beyond what would the in network price would be? And the statutes vary on that. Um, you know, you're also going to have an ERISA issue here, um, and you know, many of these balance billing laws or, or surprise statutes actually explicitly carve out ERISA plans or carve out what's uh, otherwise known as self-insured plans that would have, have an ERISA application. But some don't, for example. Illinois doesn't, um, which leads me to maybe a little bit of a discussion on a practical uh, problem I had with an Illinois case. Illinois does have balanced billing uh, laws, um, fairly comprehensive, um, but in my judgment, uh, no offense to our wonderful legislator, not written very well. And uh, I was in an arbitration a few years back uh, involving uh, the surprise billing or the uh, what I'll call balance billing or um, really kind of a what came up was it was just an out of network dispute uh, and it was invoking the Illinois statute, which I'll just give to you if you care to read it. It's 215 ILCS 5 backslash 356Z Zulu point three. Um, that is the statute in Illinois on re re resolving uh, out-of-network disputes. So it covers balanced billing, but it also covers how it's supposed to be resolved. It provides for an arbitration, and it doesn't do a heck of a lot more than that. And it's very vague, and it's very broad. And so I ended up in an arbitration with a uh, uh, payer uh, against a, a fairly large provider. It was a somewhat substantial dispute, and it ended up after we were done, both parties hated this statute and hated the process because it was it turned into a very expensive process. Uh, long story short, um, unlike some of the other balanced billing laws in Illinois, it doesn't carve out ERISA plans. It doesn't mention them. It doesn't say anything. And I had a situation where I had. What in, what in my mind was clearly an ERISA preemption argument and that we should have been in, in court or, or in an arbitration but not applying this law because this law was very, very vague on how the dispute was to be decided and it set forth a standard and it, it was not one that we cared for. Um, and so, you know, we brought motions for 
uh, preemption and, and briefed it and spent a lot of money and got nowhere. So um, it, it just uh, this the statute is, is is not needs a little work, I think. So I just bring that out as a practical issue. Um, the states that have comprehensive um, statutes, and I've cited to in the paper in this uh, presentation, um, I think it's, um, oh, Commonwealth Fund, it's on there. Um, that has a nice list of, and it's pretty current, I think it's current on yeah, September, uh, of who's got comprehensive and who's got less comprehensive, and it actually has like, you know, a nice little chart with checks that you can follow on. But, but there are many states, uh, California, Illinois, Connecticut, Florida, uh, Texas, Maryland, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Virginia, Colorado, Georgia, Massachusetts, New Mexico, and Washington that have really robust um, statutes on surprise billing. They generally hold the consumer harmless. They cover ER and non-ER, and they apply to all plans, PPO, HMO. They also have provisions requiring notice to consumers about uh, surprise billing, so that kind of reminds them, make sure you go in network, that sort of thing. Uh, and they also usually provide for a method to determine how much to pay the pro uh, provider and whether there's arbitration or mediation. Um, and they mostly do, except for wonderful Illinois, uh, refer to self-insured plans as being accepted out. Um, Virginia is a good recent example. They're, they just passed a law in, I want to say, uh, September, October, maybe it was July time frame, um, with a comprehensive balance, balance billing prohibition. There's been some regulations that have been uh, uh, also uh, enacted that are all effective January 2021. Um, and that provides for a payment to the providers for out-of-network as commercially reasonable. And it actually also sets up a database for determining what's commercially reasonable. In the case of Virginia, it's, it may be fair health. I'm not sure if the regs aren't real clear on what that's going to be. I think they're leaving it up to the um, to the uh, uh, to, to the the officials, the health department there, whatever they call their health department. Um, Texas, I know, for example, uh, uh, under SB 1264, which is their balance billing prohibition, which was enacted, I believe, Jan 1, 2020, that one um, uses uh, fair health data. Uh, Texas uh, has mediation for facilities and arbitrations for providers, non-facility providers. But they use fair health data as the uh, benchmark, and fair health data, as I mentioned before, is the, is the, the successor to Nginx. A um, little bit, uh, I think I cite to it, there's a Texas Department of Insurance biennial report, which I cite to in this uh, slide here. It was just came out in December uh, this month, and um, it kind of gives some data on how uh, what's happened in 2020 after SB 1264, which is their balance billing, was enacted. There's some nice stuff in there. You can read it for yourself. I'm not going to quote it other than to tell you complaints by consumers on balance billing went down 96%, and um, complaints by providers went down 70% uh, over the year when this was enacted. So I think there's some element of success in that. Um, they've they received 32,000 arbitration requests from January 1 to October 31, um, and now our request would be coming from uh, providers, so they'd be physicians, not facilities. Um, but it's a, turned into quite an industry um, uh, to do that. But of course, that's 32,000 potential cases that aren't in the courthouse, right? Um, so that's probably good. There's some federal legislation on the scene to deal with surprise billing. Nothing enacted yet, but I cited, I think, the the three bills that are kind of in play right now. You guys can look it up, but that's something that's on the horizon. Um, I, I got to – I think I'm done. I'm going to turn it over to Katie. I probably used more of my time. apologize, Katie. Go ahead. Thanks, Ed. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about Medicare Advantage and Medicaid MCO issues. Um, I'd like to start off by jumping into some False Claims Act concerns that we've seen recently. Um, the district court for the Southern District of New York recently unsealed a 2017 case uh, in which the relator alleges that a Medicare Advantage or an organization or an MAO uh, defrauded the government by submitting false risk adjustment data for its Medicare Advantage plans. 
Um, under Medicare Part C, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, uh, adjust, make risk adjustments to their payments to MAOs, monthly capitated payments, in order to pay MAOs more um, for beneficiaries who had serious medical concerns, which otherwise wouldn't have been accounted for. Um, this is a case where the uh, relator alleged, among other things, that the defendant designed a um, primary care program to increase its Medicare Advantage risk scores. Um, specifically, um, the allegations include that the program prioritized plan members and that the uh, analytics were used to yield the highest risk scores possible for those member assessments. Um, this is particularly um, important because we've seen an increase in these types of cases. Um, MAOs are continuing to see their business practices under attack um, from relators and at times the government because there's a perception that the practices that they're undertaking are designed to increase their risk scores and in turn increase those payments. Um, and this is interesting because MAOs need to be innovative, especially in the current healthcare climate, in order to ensure that their members receive the best possible services from them. Um, yet, on the flip side, any program designed to increase uh, services to members can have the um, undesired effect of increasing, or maybe not undesired effect, but it can have a secondary effect of increasing risk scores, which in turn um, creates an uptick in these types of False Claims Act cases. Um, we've seen that this issue um, continues to be complicated by the fact that CMS has not issued any substantive guidance on how plans can implement these innovative programs without facing um, on the back end, these False Claims Act complaints and allegations. Um, so similarly, in September of this year, um, the Eastern District of Pennsylvania issued a press release um, regarding a settlement entered into by a Pennsylvania Medicare Advantage plan for a little over $2 million to resolve allegations of inflated plan bids. Um, the Government alleged that the defendant incorrectly calculated its actual prior costs um, in its financial plan bid submitted to CMS for um, the prior contract years of 2009 and 2012. Uh, the government alleged that the incorrect and inflated prior cost data resulted in a higher base amount paid to defendant, um, which was uh, obviously inflated by their um, by their bid. So something interesting that we saw in the press release for the settlement was that the U.S. attorney um, was quoted to say that uh, that they're continuing to um, investigate these types of plans and complex, or excuse me, complex Medicare Advantage Part C cases. Um, specifically when the alleged conduct has potential implications for uh, Medicare beneficiaries and drives up the cost of Medicare Advantage plans. Um, it's really going to show that the government isn't easing up on these cases. They're continuing to um, you know, move forward um, in many cases in pursuing them. So it's something to definitely be aware of um, as we move forward. One other uh, point that I'd like to touch on quickly are the new Medicaid managed care regulations. Um, in November of this year, CMS uh, finalized changes to the Medicaid managed care regulations. Um, they made changes or alterations to a number of different areas, including network adequacy, beneficiary protection, quality measures, and payment. Um, but one change that I wanted to highlight specifically is likely to affect um, our litigation as we move forward this year. So the 2020 final rule allows states to shorten the time frame within which an enrollee can request 
um, a state fair hearing to appeal a health plan decision to deny or terminate a covered service. Um, in 2016, the final rule provided enrollees with 120 days. This new rule allows states to set the time frame for the appeal from anywhere between 90 to 120 days. Um, the 2020 rule also eliminates the requirement that beneficiaries submit a written and signed appeal after an oral appeal is submitted. Um, this is particularly important in the litigation sphere because one of the main arguments that you can have um, in litigation is that an, a member has not exhausted the appeals process. Uh, meaning that they didn't uh, appeal the decision within the correct amount of time or they hadn't taken all the necessary steps to appeal the process. So, for example, under the 2016 rule, if a member had only made an oral appeal and not um, then also submitted a written signed appeal, there could have been an argument that the um, member didn't exhaust the appeals process here with this 2020 rule, members are no longer required to do that. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind as we're, as we're litigating these types of cases. Next up, we're gonna talk about issues involving alternative dispute resolution. And I'll turn it over to Ed and Steve to get us started. Um, yeah, real quick, I think we're gonna run out of time. So um, it might make sense. Um, the only thing I would mention, and this is from a perspective of actually a case that we had, as well as um, uh, being a AAA neutral, um, I think that you're going to get a lot of questions about do we have an in-person hearing or not, and I think the, the push from uh, the perspective of the, the arbitrator as well as the, the, the uh, participants is, is that these hearings probably, until things change to the better, uh, will be uh, not be in person, it just, even if both parties want it. That's that's kind of where we landed on one of our cases. But maybe Katie, you could talk about a couple of two cases that that you found real quick, just to highlight them and maybe provide the sites if the folks want to follow up on them. Yeah, that's great. Um, so there are two recent cases um, involving alternative dispute resolution that I think are interesting to highlight for you. Uh, the first is in Re McCollum. It's site is 2020 Westlaw 6270572. It's a bankruptcy case from the Northern District of Mississippi. Um, in that case, the court found that um, our, an arbitration clause in the party's agreement was enforceable as to non-bankruptcy claims. So ancillary claims that were not uh, part of the core bankruptcy issue um, were subject to that arbitration clause and um, the court granted the motion to compel arbitration there. Um, so I think that's interesting to keep in mind as companies are moving forward with, um, with bankruptcy given COVID um, that not all claims um, are necessarily going to be uh, within the purview of the bankruptcy court and some will still be um, controlled by that arbitration clause. The other case that I think is worth noting is called uh, Borrower Property Management LLC versus Oro Carrick North LLC, and the site is 979F3-491, um, and it's a Sixth Circuit case um, where the Court of Appeals was um, assessing whether or not pre-litigation letters, so demand letters going back and forth between the parties ahead of filing suit, um, could constitute waiver of the party's right to arbitrate under their contract. Um, the dispute uh, initially arose um, and both parties sent letters back and forth regarding um, their intent to sue. Uh, specifically, the defendant in that case submitted a letter to plaintiffs saying that um, if plaintiff did not respond to the letter within six days indicating its intent to arbitrate, it would file suit in state or federal court. Um, instead of responding to that letter, plaintiff filed its own suit for breach of contract um, and then defendant moved to compel arbitration pursuant to the party's contract. The district court initially found that the defendant had waived its right to arbitrate um, because of that pre-litigation letter. 
But on appeal, the Sixth Circuit noted that nothing in that letter expressly disavowed its right to arbitrate, and therefore the company did not waive that right, and the motion to compel arbitration should have been granted. So those are some things to keep in mind as you consider whether or not to proceed with the court system or in an arbitration setting. So maybe we could take questions. I'm not sure. I think we'd click the Q&A button if anybody's got questions. I think that's how that works. So if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, we can be done, unless Steve's got some. I'll leave it up to Steve if he's got any final comments. No, I think you guys covered the ADR section quite well. So with that, I think we'll just thank you all for joining us, and we'll conclude the webinar. Thank you.